folks, it's great to be back with you again. Um, obviously, you have forgotten how bad it was the last time you invited me back. <laughs> but around here, it's primarily you entertain yourselves because you're going to do the singing. Now, this is quite loud, so I'm going to stand the way back from it so you don't hear me singing. <laughs> um, I'll get you started then. If you see me hitting back behind the wall, there's two reasons. One, you don't, don't you to hear me singing, and two, if you throw anything at me, you'll hit the wall first. <laughs> So we're going to start with some Christmas carols to get us into the mood, and uh, I'll try and tell a wee joke or two before, but before I start, I um, just want to tell a wee story, and I, it's quite sad, but, you know, it'll put us in the mood for it, hopefully. We man and woman were married for 52 years, and, you know, looked after each other, and unfortunately, she took terminally ill. But she had a box that she'd kept all her life and kept it locked all her married life and always kept a key and her husband didn't know what was in that box so as she's lying on her deathbed he said to her mary could you tell me what's in the box she says well i'll give you the key so she gave him the key and he opened it up and there was a little knitted doll just one wee knitted doll and twenty-five thousand pounds and he said <coughs> Well, what's with the knitted doll? And he said, well, she says, when I first got married, my mother said to me, if you ever get annoyed with him, if he ever annoys you, don't be shouting at him. Don't, do, just knit a wee doll, she says, and that'll ease all the tensions, she says, and then things will be fine. And he was really choked up to find there was only one doll. Definitely wasn't me. <laughs> he, he says, this is terrible, he says, I have only annoyed you once, isn't that great? He said, but where did the £25,000 come from? She said, well, that's the money I made from selling all the dolls. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, <clears throat> we're going to start with O Come All Ye Faithful. Now, Brian's going to play it, and I'm going to step back from the mic, but you're going to sing it. I'll lead this off, hopefully, if um, Brian can get the, the music going. <clears throat> Right. 
Concerning women, sure it was a constant word of his. Stay well away from them that's thin, their tempers easy is. What I knew too, I thought would do, but still I had me fears. So I fluttered back and forward between the two for years. No fortune had we Margaret, to, but two rosy cheeks would please. The farmer land was Bridget's, but she took cowpox disease. Now Margaret, she was small and slim, and Bridget, she was stout. We have face just like a jail deer with a bolt spilled out. <laughs> I'll tell the truth of Margaret. She thought a word of me. I'll tell no lie. My heart would leap the sight of her to see. But I was slow. You surely know the reason for it now. If I left her home from Cairn, and sure my dad would raise her eye. So I footed back and forward. To Margaret got a man. A fella come from Muller Slim and left me just the one. I mean the day she went away. A head once struck an hour. And cursed it was from Cullantra that made me da so sour. 
but Mopin cures no ill, so the bridge and I went back, and faced her for that night week for nance their own turf stack. I asked her there, and spoke her fair, the handy wife she'd make me. I talked about the land that joined. Do you know, she wouldn't take me. So I'm sitting in Drumlister, and I'm getting very ill. I creep to Carmen once a month to try and make me sow. A devil a man in this town long was clearer reared near me. But I'm dying in Drumlister, in clover to the knee. Thank you. <clears throat> Every night a wee man used to go out into his back garden and hoot like an owl because he loved birds and whatnot. So he would out every night and hoot it like an owl. And after a lot of months, an owl hooted back and he thought, this was brilliant. So he'd go, do it do. And then come back, do it do. And he thought, this is great. And this went on for over a year. And he thought, I've made a breakthrough in how to talk to the birds. And he was just about to write a book and his wife happened to be out hanging up the washing in the garden and she's seen the woman next door and she says, you know my husband's awful stupid, she says. He goes out here every night and he hoots like an owl and he thinks the owls are hooting back to him and the other woman says, funny enough, she says, my husband goes out and hoots like an owl too. <laughs> <laughs> so let's go, <coughs> our last, <coughs> excuse me, our last carol tonight and then we'll go on to the Christmas songs but before that Audrey wants to say words so we'll have our, our last carol just giving you a bit of warning here that this is the last one get yourselves psyched up you know okay away in the manger now we all know this from we were that height and it's a lovely little song so let's have away in the manger okay levels. for butter. I shall sit down on the pavement when I'm tired and gobble up samples and shops and press alarm bells and run my stick along the public railings and make up for the sobriety of my youth. I shall go out in my slippers in the rain 
and pick the flowers in other people's gardens and learn to spit. <laughs> you can wear terrible shirts and grow more fat and eat three pounds of sausages at a go or only bread and pickle for a week and hoard pens and pencils and mats and things in, bo in boxes. But now you must have clothes that keep us dry and pay our rent and not swear in the street and set a good example for the children. We must have friends to dinner and read the papers. But maybe I ought to practice a little now so people who know me are not too shocked or surprised when suddenly I am old and start to wear purple. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> uh, uh, the uh, Maureen should have been doing this, Maureen Wilson, my sister, and um, she wasn't able to make it tonight, so she sent these to me to do. So if you can bear with me, uh, there's another short one, and then uh, she sent a joke <laughs> to you. So this is called Dust If You Must. Dust if you must, but wouldn't it be better to paint a picture or write a letter, bake a cake or plant a seed, ponder the difference between want and need. Dust if you must, but there's not much time with rivers to swim and mountains to climb, music to hear and books to read, friends to cherish and life to lead. Dust if you must, but the world's out there with the sun in your eyes and the wind in your hair. A flutter of snow, a shower of rain, this day will not come around again. Dust if you must, but bear in mind, old age will come and that's not kind. And when you go, and go you must, you yourself will make more dust. <laughs> So uh, this is getting married and Jacob was 92 and Rebecca was 89 and they were living in Devon. All were excited about their decision to get married. They go for a stroll to discuss the wedding and on the way they pass a pharmacy. Jacob suggests they go in. Jacob addresses the man behind the counter. Are you the owner? The pharmacist says yes. Jacob. We're about to get married. Do you sell heart medication? Pharmacist, of course we do. Jacob, how about medicine for circulation? Pharmacist, all kinds. Jacob, medicine for rheumatism? Pharmacist, definitely. Jacob, how about suppositories? <laughs> Pharmacist, you bet. Jacob, medicine for memory problems, arthritis, and Alzheimer's. Pharmacist, yes, a large variety, the works. Jacob, what about vitamins, sleeping pills, um, antidotes for Parkinson's disease? Pharmacist, absolutely. Jacob, everything for heartburn, anything for heartburn and indigestion? We sure do. Jacob, we sell, uh, do you sell wheelchairs and walkers and canes? All speeds and sizes. Jacob, adult incontinence pants. Pharmacist, sure. Jacob says, we'd like to use this store for our wedding present list. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, this is her, uh, her sad bit, this one. <laughs> um, my Christmas card list. And excuse me, if my two friends had been here, who should have been here, they would have been sick over the side when they hear this week home. But anyway, we'll, we'll do it. I have a list of folks I know all written in a book. And every year when Christmas comes, I go and take a look. 
That is when I re realise these names are all a part, not of the book they're written in, but of my very heart. For each name stands for someone who has crossed my path some time, and in that meeting they've become the rhythm of any rhyme. While it may sound fantastic for me to make this claim, I really feel that I'm composed of each remembered name. And while you may not be aware of any special link, just meeting you has changed my life much more than you may think. For once I've met somebody, the years cannot erase the memory of a pleasant word or of a friendly face. So never think my Christmas cards are just a mere routine of names upon a Christmas list forgotten in between. For when I send a Christmas card that's addressed to you, it's because you're on the list of folks that I'm indebted to. For I am but the total of many folks I've met, and you happen to be one of those I prefer not to forget. Whether I have known you for many years or few, in some way you have had a part of shaping things I do. And every year when Christmas comes, I realise in you, one of the nicest gifts in life is meeting folks like you. So may the spirit of Christmas that forevermore endures leave its richest blessing in the heart of you and yours. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Now we're going to get on to singing the songs we all sang as kids, you know, Winter Wonderland, Rudolph the Red Nose Rangers, all that sort of thing, so really belt them out. But just before that, I have to tell you another sad little story. <laughs> Woman's washing machine broke down. Now, you will know what it's like when your washing machine goes and you have to get the scrubbing board out again. And you're not used to doing that because you did that when you were younger. And you've got away from all that now. You've gone through the twin tubs into the automatic washing machines, but when they break down, you've got to get back to the washing board and whatnot. So woman was a bit annoyed, so she called in the washing machine repair man. So he came along, had a good look around it. Mm -hmm. Aye, mm -hmm. And they always give that sharp intake of breath when they're going to give you bad news, don't they? You go, mm -hmm. Aye, right. Mm -hmm. She says, can you fix it? He says, aye. I think so. Hold on a minute. So he gives a hammer. He gives a hammer out and he gives a hammer. The washing machine is great whack with a hammer. He says, try that. So she switches on right enough. It starts. He says, I are. That, that should be all right now. He says, just wait out and make him out a bill here. So he gives her a bill. Repairs the washing machine. £200. She says, £200? For three? All you did was hit it with a hammer. He says, hold on. You're, you're quite right. He says, I'll give you an item of his bill. So he tore that up. He wrote out another one. He says, he gave it to her. And she looks at it. She says, for hitting a washing machine with hammer, £5. For knowing where to hit washing machine with hammer, £195. <laughs> <laughs> so it's all in knowing where to hit it. <clears throat> so we're going to sing Winter Wonderland. Now it starts with sleigh bells ring, are you listening? And sometimes, uh, sleigh bells ring, are you listening? <laughs> but we'll not do that, because now the woven is all up, you're all ready to go. Okay, well. <clears throat> Job in your time. Later on, 
What the heck do you do with a turkey when all the best bits have been ate? And the longer you look at the carcass, the more and more scundered you get. But it seems such a pity to waste it and to throw it straight out in the bin. So you try to compose a new recipe where you can slip all them old brown bits in. So you chop up some mushrooms and onions and you stir up a nice curry mix. Then you lob on the turkey leftovers and hey presto, a dinner for six. It's not bad served with rice, white and fluffy. You're a cookery genius, that's plain. The wains take one look at the dinner and say, Hounds, not turkey again. <laughs> right, let's see, where were we? Well, we dog goes into your grocer's shop with a basket in his mouth and puddles up to the desk at the counter and the man looks down, oh, right. Takes a note out of the basket, gets all the groceries, puts, puts them into the basket, takes money out of the basket, gets the change, puts it back, opens the door and the wee dog trots out with a basket full of groceries and the change. And the man's down watching, he says, that's fantastic. That is really fantastic. He says, oh, we do you? Oh, he says, oh, does it all the time. He says, you're joking. He says, oh, uh, nearly every day, about 10 o'clock in the morning. So the next morning the wee man goes out, he says, oh, check this out. So the next morning he's down the shop, 10 o'clock. Right enough, the dog comes in with the basket, Closer takes them, oh yeah, right, gets the messages, puts them in the basket, gets the money, puts the change in, dog out again. The boy says, it's unbelievable. He said, I'm going to follow that dog to see where it goes. So he follows the dog and it goes across the street, down a lane, across another street, up another laneway, and out into the countryside, and out to this wee cottage on its own. And it goes up and it drops the basket at the door, and woof, 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 at the door. Nothing happens. Woof, 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 woof. And that lady comes and eventually opens the door and gives the dog a kick as it's going in. And the man goes up, he says, that's ridiculous. He says, so he goes up and knocks the door and the lady comes to the door. He says, I've just been watching you. He says, that dog is fantastic. He says, it goes and gets your groceries. I'm told it does it every day. And come back, he says, it's absolutely fantastic. And you give it a kick. She says, I know that's the fifth time it's forgot its keys. <laughs> <coughs> We'll try Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. Yeah. Yeah. That reminds me of another joke, but uh, I'm not saying it. Oh, well, I may as well bore you something. A lady and her husband were visiting Russia, and they went to stay with a guy called Rudolph. And they were looking out the window <coughs> one night, and the boy says, Oh, Rudolph, I see it's starting to snow. And Rudolph the Russian says, No, that is not snow, that is rain. He says, no, no, it's snow. He says, like, it's snow. He said, it is rain. And his wife turned around to her husband and said, listen, Rudolph the Red knows reindeer. <laughs> <coughs> okay, no. Right, Rudolph the Red knows reindeer. <coughs> Rudolph the Red knows reindeer had a very shiny nose. Oh, 
a, Texas, a Texan was visiting Australia on a holiday and uh, he was going around and he stopped with this Australian farmer. He said, excuse me boy, he says, uh, what's that you're growing in the fields there? And the Australian said, that sweet digger? Wheat, he says. Oh no, he says, it's back home in, in Texas where I come, he says, the wheat's about three times the size of that in our fields are mile long, he says, that's, that's not a field of wheat. He says, uh, what, what sort of cows do you have? He says, that's my cows over there, dig it. He says, no, no, he says, back in Texas, we have long horns, he says, three times the size of that. And just at that, a couple of kangaroos bounced across the road. An American had never seen kangaroos before, and he says, hey, mate. He says, what are they? He says, do you not have grasshoppers in America? <laughs> Right. <laughs> was the pig fair last September, a day I well remember. I was staggering through the town in drunken pride, till my knees began to flutter and I fell down in the gutter, and a pig came up and lay down by my side. As I lay there in the gutter, thinking thoughts I could not utter, I heard a passing lady make a say, you can tell the man who boozes by the company he chooses. On hearing that, the pig got up and walked away. <laughs> oh, jingle bells, jingle bells. Jingle bells, jingle bells, jingle bells, rock. No. Right, jingle bells, we all know jingle bells. Do you know jingle bells? <laughs> That's close enough. Jingle bells, jingle bells, jingle all the way. Oh, what fun it is to ride on one horse open sleigh. Oh, Open sleigh through the fields we go, laughing all the way. Bells on Balkan ring, making spirits fly. What fun it is to ride and sing a sleigh song tonight! Oh, jingle bells, some the spells of jingle all the way. Oh, what fun it is to ride in a one horse open sleigh! Oh, jingle bells, jingle bells, jingle all the way. Oh, what fun it is to ride in a long, 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 long sleigh. Oh, that was good. Your hands never left your wrist. <laughs> Mom was driving home from work and he realised he'd forgotten his daughter's birthday. And he knew she'd be very disappointed. But he also knew she loved Barbie dolls. So we went into a toy shop and he said to the toy shop girl, he says, do you have any Barbie dolls? She says, yes, we have Barbie Goes Shopping, 1950. We have Barbie Bakes a Cake, 1950. Barbie the Fashion Doll, 1950. And we've divorced Barbie at 60, 65 pounds. He says, uh, hold on, he says, uh, all the others are 1950. Divorced Barbie, 60, uh, Barbie 65 pounds. Well, how come? She says, well, with divorced Barbie, you get Ken's car, you get Ken's <laughs> motorbike, you get Ken's car. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I saw Mummy kissing Santa Claus. I did, I told him. I definitely, definitely saw Mummy kissing Santa Claus. She says, I saw Mummy kissing Santa Claus underneath the bristle tool last night. I thought she'd kiss him underneath the moustache, you know, <laughs> somewhere back there. Right, here we go.
Locked out of his mind, didn't know where he was. So the wife, of course, gives him verbal GBH for an ear hole, and rightly so. And after about four or five hours, she says, How would you like to say if you didn't see me for four or five days? It suits me fine. She says, I don't care. There's no problem to me. So come Monday, he didn't see her. Come Tuesday, he still didn't see her. Wednesday, he didn't see her. Thursday, the swell had gone down just enough in his left eye. He could just make out a wee bit of her. <laughs> <clears throat> Santa Claus is coming to town. Sometime. <clears throat> you better watch out, you better not cry. You better not pout, I'm telling you why. Santa Claus is coming to town. He's making a list, he's checking it twice. He's gonna find out who's looking at Santa Claus is coming to town. He sees you when you're sleeping. He knows when you're awake. He knows when. Christmas gives you trying to find out what to buy people, you know. Again, it's written, I think, by Maud Steele, if I remember right. It is written by Maud Steele, so I'll try and do it in a, a lady's accent. If you, <laughs> you see, Christmas, it's only a nuisance. I'm brain daft long before it gets here. We're shopping and panicking and rushing, and every night, everything's now got that dear. The wheels have been cracking for months now. This whole Santa thing is a cod. You could run yourself into a fortune to convince him it's not a big fraud. They see all those overpriced rubbish advertised every day on TV. And as mammy, will Santa bring me that? You'd think they've got it all for free. There's all this keeping up with the Joneses. We Jimmy's getting a BMX bike. 
and we lure us getting a cabbage patch doll kid and a big pram. Do you ever hear the like? And John, there he wants a computer that costs 200 pounds, maybe more. And May wants a TV for her own room. Boys, wouldn't me, wins make your head sore? But I wonder if these fancy presents would bring half the excitement we got as we crept down on Christmas morning and discovered a big lumpy sock. Boys, we danced with delight when we found out that our Santa had come after all and brought us a sock full of presents. The more now that would mean seemed very small. We would hook out a pencil and rubber, a paint box, a hanky, a book, a wee bag of gold coloured chocolate and an apple and orange from the foot. We were happy with these simple items. Wayne's now would say, that's not fair. But Santa Claus brought us great pleasure and you didn't have to be a millionaire. But the Wayne's would grow up in a few years and with Santa they'll no longer fuss and it's high Christmas lost most of its magic since Santa stopped coming to us. So perhaps it is worth all the bother to make some of their wee dreams come true and give them something nice to look back on when they're earner like me and like you. Where are we now? I've had over Frosty the Snowman. Right, Frosty the Snowman. Cool enough for Frosty the Snowman this morning. I was out playing golf this morning and I tell you, I was for like Frosty myself. Now we're going to do this twice. I'm just give me a warning now. Okay. And if I like it, we'll maybe do it three times. <coughs> Frosty the snowman was a jolly happy soul With a corn cob pipe and a button nose And his eyes made out of coal Frosty the snowman made children laugh and play And were all that Christ when he opened their eyes And he came to life that day There must have been some magic In that old help they found for when they placed it on his head, he began to dance around. Oh, Frosty the snowman was alive as he could be. And the children say he could laugh and play just the same as he ran me. We'll try and do it right this day. The snowman was a jolly, happy soul. With a corn cold pipe and a button nose, and his eyes made out of coal. Frosty the snowman made the children laugh and play And were they surprised when before their eyes he came to life that day There must have been some magic in the dogs who had they found For when they placed it on his head he began to dance around Oh, Frosty the snowman was alive as he could be and the children say he can laugh and play Just to say as you and me The first verse is here, I was just trying them out you know, Throwing in words that weren't there Very poor, aren't they? A man was owed 500 pounds by his neighbour But he had no proof of it So he thought, how am I going to get this 500 pounds in this boy? He says, I can't prove that he owes me it so he went along to a solicitor and he says, uh, could you help me out? He says, my neighbour owes me £500, but I've no proof of it. So the solicitor says, okay, he says, uh, send him a letter saying, reminding him that he owes you £5,000. He says, no, 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 I said £500. He says, I know, but if you send him a letter saying he owes you £5,000, he'll send you back. No, I only owe you £500. <laughs> There's your proof, he says. <laughs> <coughs> We man and woman got a new housing executive house and they thought it was great to get into this new housing executive house but they didn't realise until they'd moved in it was right at the railway line and the trains were coming night and day and the wee woman couldn't get to sleep. All night the trains were coming and going, all day the trains were coming and going. So she rang the housing executive to complain and she rang the world off and eventually sent somebody around to check out the noise. So he's sitting in the living room and the train went by and she says, there, there's a train, you hear that? He says, oh, well, that's not too bad. He says, according to my machine, it's, it's well within the tolerance limits. She says, well, it's worse out in the kitchen, come on. So he went out to the kitchen 
and another train went by. She says, look, what do you think of that? He says, no, it's still within the tolerance, it's all right. She says, it's worse upstairs, come on up to the bedroom, it's worse in the bedroom. She says, you couldn't get to sleep, couldn't blink an eye. So they got up and she says, look, lie down in that bed. So he lay down in the bed and she lay down beside him, <laughs> waiting for the train to come. And just at that, her husband came back, he had left his lunch. So he came back from work to get his lunch and he shouts, oh, Maisie, where are you? No sign of Maisie. So he wanders up the stairs and there he finds Maisie in the man from the house executive lying in the bed. She says, what are you doing lying in the bed with my wife? He says, now you're not going to believe this, but we're actually waiting for a train. Oh dear, oh dear, where did I get them from? I should leave them wherever I get them. Let's see now. White Christmas, we're going to finish with White Christmas. Is it too early? Now, they used to say that this was the uh, national anthem from South Africa, but they're not allowed to say that anymore. That's right. Okay, I didn't say that. If you're ever wanting anybody to come along and talk to you about work in Africa, in Uganda in particular, I'd be only too happy to come. I go to Uganda every two years. I support an orphanage and school out there, our church does, and I uh, go out every two years to make sure everything's going fine. Uh, I really love it. So if you want to hear, uh, hear some more about a place called Fairways, where it is the happiest place in the world, and I know Disney has that up, in Disneyland, this is the happiest place in the world. I've had people along with me to Fairways. I take teams out from time to time with me. And I've taken people out who have been to Disneyland. I haven't been, but people have been to Disneyland. And they've turned around to me and said, Disney thinks it's the happiest place in the world. This is the happiest place in the world. The children have nothing, but they are so happy. And they're getting a good Christian education. It started off, uh, it was started by a minister, uh, 
an Anglican minister, a Ugandan Anglican minister and his wife. And they start the school with 12 children. The time we got in touch with it in 2006, they had 180 children at a primary school. And about 70 or 80 of them lived in the place full time. Now, we couldn't have kept animals in the conditions they were living in. It was so bad, but it was better than living on the street. And you've seen the ads of children lying in the streets and you know, they could be abused, kidnapped, whatever. That does happen. I've driven through Kampala and my heart has been broken seeing children four and five just lying on cardboard in the streets. I'd love to be able to help them all, but I can't help everybody. We now have 570 children at our school and orphanage. We now teach not only primary school, but we go from nursery school right up to A level. And our 375 children live in the orphanage full time. They have no relatives. They are orphans, but they are cared for. We send £2,200 out every month from our church to feed them. That just about feeds them. And sometimes the teachers get paid, sometimes they don't. But the teachers are fantastic. We have a, a great team of Christian teachers who stick with it. They know they'll get paid sometime. And we, we run extra fundraisers to get money. But that's just a little taster of what we can do. And we have a slideshow, etc. that we can show you. So if you're looking for someone sometime and you can't think of anybody or somebody drops out, Give me a shout. I'm really too glad to come along and speak to you about fairways. And just finish with a joke. I normally tell jokes about blondes and I get told off about it. I've been threatened. I was teaching, uh, taking a, a show down in our own church three weeks ago and I told a couple of jokes about blondes and two of the ladies refused to give me tea at the interval. They said they were so annoyed with me. Thankfully, a ginger haired lady came up and gave me tea and she was laughing her head off. But anyway, this blonde girl got a job as a secretary. It was her first job and she wanted to impress. And she was told her first job was to go and get coffee for the people. So she thought, I'm really impressed. So she went in and she got a big flask and took it down to the coffee shop. And she said to the guy in the coffee shop, would that hold six cups of coffee? So he looked at her and he said, yeah, yeah, that would hold six cups of coffee. He says, could, could I have two decaf, two latte and two filter coffee, please? <laughs> So with that, I say thank you very much indeed. I wish you all a very happy Christmas and thank you once again for having us today.
for a man in red, a little tree and a horse drawn sleigh. How do I save them and make them see? My love is complete, my grace is free. How do I help them when all they know is a talking snowman and a box with a bow? Maybe next year they will stop and see the greatest gift of Christmas is the little child. Everybody, I think we can really say that was an enjoyable evening, wasn't it? Yes. And we can't thank you enough. And the music and everything was great, and all the, the funny things and everything, it was brilliant. Thank so, on behalf of us all, Tom, thank you very much, and I hope you have a lovely Christmas. Thank you very, much, very much. much. Okay, Brian, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Well, ladies. Thank you very, very much for inviting me along. I was glad I came. It was really, really excellent. Maybe Tom, I should explain uh, the reason why I'm here. I thought you were the two bouncers. No, <laughs> <laughs> I The reason I, I'm here is the fact that in this congregation here, the session nominated one elder to look after one organisation. <laughs> See all these lovely ladies? <laughs> And uh, the doctor uh, looked after him all right, and uh, just as he was getting up to go out, the doctor says to him, Now, is there anything I can do for you? Is there anything else I can do for you? And he says, Well, doctor, it's like this. He says, It's not really me, he says, but it's my wife. <laughs> and, and the doctor says, Well, what's wrong with your wife? He says, Well, he says, To be quite honest with you, he says, I think she's going a bit deaf. Well, oh, the doctor she says, there, well, why, why don't you ask her? He says, I don't, I don't, don't like doing that. Don't, don't, don't like. He says, well, I'll tell you what to do. The doctor said to him, you see, whenever you go home from here, you go in the door, <coughs> close the door, and stand at the door, and shout down, my dear, what's for dinner today? Okay. So he says, oh, so what? He says, well, he says, if she hears you, there's nothing wrong with her hearing. If she doesn't, if you don't hear anything, go a wee bit further down the hall and shout, dear, what's for dinner today? And if she doesn't hear anything, go a wee bit further down by the kitchen door where she sees in the kitchen and shout, dear, what's for dinner today? So he says, that's right. So he goes home and he goes in the front door, closes the door and says, Dear, what's for dinner today? Nothing. So he goes down the hall a wee bit for her. Dear, what's for dinner today? Nothing. So he goes to the kitchen door and he, there she is over the, kit, the kitchen sink. And he says, Dear, what's for dinner today? And she turns around and she says, Steak and onions and potatoes, that's the third time I've told you. <laughs> <laughs> and the other one, and the, can I tell you not? Can I tell you not? <laughs> Tom, Tom, Tom put it in the head whenever he, whenever he told the joke. This wee fella went to see Santa Claus with his mummy and daddy. And uh, of course he goes in and he sees Santa, and Santa says to him, Get some of the And he says, ah, What would you like me to bring you for Christmas, son? And the wee fella says, Santa, I would love the top rate BMX bike with 30 gears. And behind him, the mummy, mummy's gone. <coughs> and he says, Santa says, well, never will tell you. He said, uh, the latest BMX bike with 30 gears. He says, that's, I, I don't know about that. He says, uh, I don't think I'd be able to get that down the chimney. 
And we fella says, well, here, Sally, he says, you got a full say snooker table down the chimney last year. <laughs> right. <laughs> right, being serious. Thank you again, ladies, for the invite. Uh, I was coming anyway. Apologise for my good wife because she's really loaded with a cold and she's staying in, her house, in the house in her bed tonight. But could I get a wee plug in? Next, uh, next Tuesday night, uh, you know, we have a team from the church here who goes down to the fold of Inverary. And we're going down next Tuesday night, Tuesday the 11th, and we're going to be singing carols. And we might take a few of these, these wee songs, if I can borrow that sheet. I might sing a few of these wee songs, and all, but you're all very, very, uh, you're, you're invited, you're very welcome, if you want to come along. It boosts up the singing a wee bit, you know. Mm-hmm. So, uh, if you if you're feel like going, what we'll do is we'll meet here at about quarter past seven, and if you need a lift down, just take you down, because we'll start about a quarter to eight. So there you go, there's another wee invitation. There's another night out for you. All right. <laughs> so let's all pray. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time of fellowship together, and we know that you are in the midst of us here. And we thank you, Heavenly Father, for being with us. And we pray that as the Christmas season comes on, that we will take Christmas to be the the, the right way. That we will not be looking at Christmas as just another time when we are going to have good fun and we are going to have uh, parties. By all means, Lord, let us do that. But let us think too about the baby that was born in Bethlehem. The boy who grew up and ministered on earth here and then gave his life on a cross for you and me. So Heavenly Father, we do pray that you will continue to be with us at this Christmas time. We thank you that that uh, man is alive today. That he is sitting at his father's right hand interceding for us. We thank you for that hope that he has given us because that he rose from the dead and defeated sin and Satan and uh, evil. And so, Lord, we pray that you will continue to be with us now. We pray and thank you for this food that we are going about to have. We pray that you will use it for the strengthening of our bodies and us in your service. For we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. There, I think we'll go that way, don't we? Yeah, I try shouting a couple of times. <laughs> what are we having for the first? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.